Uh, it is a great joy to be able to welcome back to MIT Steve Ruskowski, who is the president and CEO of Quest Diagnostics. Steve is also a 1984 graduate of our very own MIT Sloan School of Management. And so reflecting on the 1984-ness of that, you can do the math uh, and celebrate with me that this is Steve's 30th uh, anniversary, 30th reunion year. And it's a special delight to be able to welcome Steve back to MIT. He's spoken um, at MIT events before, uh, but it's a special joy to be able to welcome him here today. Uh, I hope that you all know a fair amount about Quest Diagnostics. Uh, I'm no substitute for Steve in that regard, uh, but you know, just to mention a couple of facts, um, it is the world's largest uh, uh, firm with respect to diagnostic information, diagnostic equipment. Uh, over 30% of United States adults interact with and are affected by uh, Quest's products. Um, over half of the physicians in the United States um, also um, are customers and uh, users of uh, Quest products. Um, surely those are out of date numbers by now because the firm is doing extremely well under Steve's leadership and of course one of the things he'll do um, is touch on that landscape of opportunity with you a bit. Steve became CEO in May of 2012 uh, and has really been at the helm even just in this last couple years of an organization that is changing fundamentally with respect to how it sees its own opportunities. Uh, Steve joined um, after having served as CEO of Philips Healthcare and growing Philips Healthcare into the largest division of Royal Philips Electronics. In addition to his MIT Sloan master's degree, he holds a, 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 a Mackey uh, bachelor's from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. There's much more to say about Steve, but let me let him tell you about it. Uh, please welcome Steve Ruskowski. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, some of you saw me give him a hug to my son over on the left, Joe. You know Joe, Joe Ruskowski. But um, it was fun to think about what I would talk to you about this morning. Um, as the dean said, I, I'm actually standing in front of you 30 years later. So I thought it'd be helpful for you to get some perspective on what happens in 30 years. So fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> so actually, it was a time for me to get a little nostalgic. And uh, you see up on the board here a copy of the catalog from the Sloan School in the year that I graduated in 1984. So uh, Joe might not remember this, but I actually have this catalog in my library of books, real books, hard copy books. So I pulled it out and started thumbing through the catalog. And what did you know? 30 years ago, I was in the catalog. That would be me. That would be me. And it's really interesting, and I, what a coincidence. But when I opened it up, what well, was next to the catalog? But at that time, it was called the Distinguished Speaker Series in 1983 and 1984. So who would have known back in 1984, that would be 30 years later standing in front of you. And uh, at that time, we had the speakers. Um, we had Douglas Frazier from the United Auto Workers, kind of interesting. We have the chairman of Alcoa. We have the chairman of US Steel. And we have the chief operating officer from Motorola. Boy, the world has changed. The world has changed. But I thought it was really interesting. And I went back and read what I actually talked about at that time. Uh, because at that point, you're looking forward. And I'd like to help you think about your journey forward. That's what I'd like to share with you this morning or this afternoon is my experiences in the last 30 years. Give you some reflections of what I've learned from that. But back 30 years ago, I actually said, boy, I'm gonna start my new job at Hewlett Packard's medical business. That's the beginning of my time at Hewlett Packard in the medical business. And at some time, it'd be great if I could run a division and have profit and loss responsibilities. That's what I thought I wanted to do back 30 years ago. So let me start with that and give you a little bit about my journey. I'm not gonna to take too long because I like to uh, 
take as many questions as you have about what I've done and things you might want to hear about and leave you enough time to get out of here to get to your first class. How's that sound? Good? Well, a little bit personally, I've introduced my son, Joe. I'm married. Uh, actually, right now, we're living in New York City, primarily. Just took this new job about two years ago, so we have an apartment in New York, an opportunity to experience New York. My office at Quest is in Madison, New Jersey. If you know that area of the country, it's a beautiful area in New Jersey, but it's a good chance for us to experience New York. Actually, Joe's sister, her name's Lauren, she went to school here as well. So Lauren graduated about four years ago, and um, she's actually just started a new job at Deloitte, consulting at Deloitte. So she's doing quite well as well. So we have a dog, Lily. Dog, Lily. Um, and I share all that with you because besides my career, um, part of this discussion is what else besides your career that you have to spend some time thinking about. You know, family, being a dad, you know, being a husband, being a son. I have a 93-year-old mom in Connecticut who I go see once every three weekends. It's quite important. And uh, it's an important part of my life. But I'd also like to share my uh, personal journey in my career. And I mentioned that in 1984 that I started my career in the tech, if you will, at uh, Hewlett Packard's medical business. Before I came to Sloan, I uh, spent about three years at Procter & Gamble. I actually have an engineering background, as you heard. Uh, spent some time actually in their management development program. Uh, managed a couple different operations in a plant here in Quincy, Massachusetts. Learned a bunch of things about managing people, managing projects, running operations, uh, managing within a great company, Procter & Gamble. But I also knew at that point, you know, this isn't quite what I wanted to do, and I needed to get a lot more tools in my toolkit to do what I really wanted to do, which was to run a business someday. So I came to Sloan. Uh, when I was at Sloan, you know, frankly, I wanted to get as much as I could in general management skills, because I was an engineer. I didn't take any economics as an engineer. I didn't take any accounting as an engineer. I didn't take any marketing as an engineer. So I wanted to experience as much, much as I could with my time here. They really prepared me to get into a much more general management track. So lo and behold, come out of Sloan School, and now I had to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I described a career kind of five-year chunks, five-year chunks. And at that point, Hewlett Packard wasn't the Hewlett Packard is today. This is really, the, I tell people, this is the original HP. You know, Bill and Dave were still there. You know, it was a cool company in Palo Alto. You know, it started in a garage in 1939. It was about $3 billion in sales. And they're primarily in the instrumentation business, not the computer business or the printer business. They were in the instrumentation business. And lo and behold, uh, Bill Hewlett, I uh, actually was a graduate at MIT. He graduated with his master's here. They're both Stanford grads. Um, had an interest in applying electronics to healthcare, and they bought a company here in Massachusetts called the Sanborn Company. Early pioneer in EKG technology. And because of that, they had their medical division for Hewlett Packard based here in Boston. Actually, one time it was here in Cambridge. Uh, later, it moved to Waltham, Massachusetts. So I started my career at Hewlett Packard in the medical business, not because I had this unbelievable desire to have an impact on healthcare, but primarily I was trying to join a company that I can see a path to learning different skills and see a path to being in a company that eventually maybe I could run a division with P&L responsibility. I saw that there. Now, well, I share that with you because it turned out I spent 30 years later, I've been in healthcare my whole career. And frankly, it's turned into more than just paying the bills. It's turned into really how I can make a contribution in this world, and I'm proud of that. But frankly, it started with the simple notion that I needed a job, I wanted to work for a good company, I had to pay the bills, and I wanted a company that showed me a path for my career. So there is a message in there, and part of the message is don't try to figure out everything. Because sometimes just things happen. It happened for good reasons. The second part of my, that part of five years of my experience, I actually, actually started my career in finance. Never thought in a million years when I sat in your seat today, back 30 years ago, uh, that I would start in finance and do something in finance. I was an engineer, worked in operations, thought I would do something in marketing. When we talked to HP, interesting stuff, well, we're looking for people that have operational backgrounds 
and want to really get involved in, in understanding a business and helping the accounting team become more operationally oriented and engaged in the business. And we can use, like, we can use people like you to join the finance team. So I saw it as an opportunity to use some of the skills I learned in business school, join a good company. So I started as a financial analyst in 1984 at Hewlett Packard's medical business. Lo and behold, I was actually pretty good at it. Had a couple of promotions, became a controller, CFO of uh, operations, of field operations, and that's the first five-year chunk of my career. Did I have everything figured out? No. Did I realize that I was going to be in healthcare for 30 years? Not really. Did I know for certain that I was going to be able to get to a, a place where I could run a business at some point? Did I ever think we're a million years that I'd be standing in front of you 30 years from now, actually making this presentation next to the people that were talking to me when I was in this classroom? I had no, no chance of even imagining that. But it was a great experience. And lo and behold, lo and behold, I uh, worked for a person that became somewhat of a mentor for me. And uh, he actually saw something else in me. He saw that in addition to something that can crunch some numbers and help him run his business, he could run a business someday. And he gave me my first general management job back in 1989. That's the next chunk of my career. I actually spent about the next 10 years managing different businesses, different sizes and shapes, and eventually became the president, general manager of Hewlett Packard's medical business in 1999. The job I dreamed of when I joined there in 1984. It was a you know, great job living in Massachusetts, running a global business in the, in the innovation space, which I enjoyed. And this was, if you recall, 99 was the tech boom and then later the tech bust. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but at that point, we decided at HP to actually spin off all the original Hewlett Packard businesses and keep the computer and printer businesses with the name Hewlett Packard, and we spun it off and we created Agilent Technologies, still headquartered in Palo Alto. And I ran the healthcare business at Agilent Technologies. And then lo and behold, if you think about 99, 2000, 2001, this was the tech boom. Telecom stocks were going crazy, communication companies were coming up all over this area. Dot coms were popular. The market was flying. We went public at $30 a share. Within two minutes, it went up to $45 a share. This was in the fall. By December, the stock was up to $60 a share. By January, it was up to $100 a share. This is an $8 billion company. And our market cap, when we turned the, the calendar year, was $50 billion. I was out in Palo Alto, never forget it, at our first ever sell side analyst, analyst meeting. We had an announcement for an optical switch, and our stock went up $50 with a press release. $50, about $25 billion worth of market cap. So you sit back, and you start looking at your stock at $150 a share. You priced it at 30. And you say, how do you possibly maintain even some, some close resemblance to the stock, stock price? So I remember sitting back in Palo Alto with you know, my management team in healthcare, but also the management team at Agilent, and frankly, you go through a really rigorous, rigorous portfolio management, and we decided to look for our options for the healthcare business. Why? We're growing about 8 to 10% at that time. Great growth now. Back then, if you weren't growing 15, 20%, you were nothing. So I actually was asked to put together a sell team represented selling the business, and sold it to Philips Electronics. Now, next piece to my career. Well, here I am for 15 years working for this, what I thought of at that point, a kind of cool California company, joining a, some of it, in my mind, an old-fashioned European company. Um, and really, the not well thought of within Philips healthcare business. They had a Fortunately for me, just started to make some investments in healthcare, and we we're one of those investments. So I said, I'll give this a try. Uh, you know, the healthcare business at HP was good to me. We sold it. I want to make sure it lands in good, you know, good shape at Phillips. I need to earn out what I sold. So I did that, and lo and behold, this next five years at Phillips, I learned a lot. They gave me a lot of responsibility. 
And it was a fabulous learning opportunity for me. Ended up working with a Dutch company, working with a European management team, learning about international business that I never was exposed to at an American company. You just never know. You never know. And then fortunately, the gentleman that was then the CEO of Philips saw something in me, and he asked me to take on taking healthcare to another level at Philips. And so in 19, excuse me, in 2006, I was asked to become the CEO of Philips Healthcare. And I ran that up until, up until the spring of 2012. So great experience in the management team at Phillips. We had an apartment in Amsterdam, house still here in Andover, Massachusetts. It was a little crazy because literally every week I was going back and forth because most of my operations were here in the United States. Headquarters was in Amsterdam. I was a Dutch employee. But what an experience and what an opportunity to build you know, the healthcare business that we built at Philips. And then you complete, the, you do that work and then things happen and you start to say, well, what's, what's the next challenge? And the next challenge for me would be to really have my own Fortune 500 public company, be able to manage it, take it to the direction. And I was approached with this, with this opportunity at Quest Diagnostics, talked to the board, and in the, the spring of 2012, I was actually asked to take on this responsibility. So I've been in this job for about 20, 22 months or so. And it's been a fabulous 22 months. A lot of change, a lot of excitement. So what I share with you is a journey of 30 years, a journey I never would have predicted, a journey that I've learned a lot, a journey I never could imagine would, you know, would, would have happened the way it exactly happened. But it's been a fun journey. And I stand in front of you today after 30 years, and I reflected a little bit on that journey. And I thought it would be helpful to give you a few things I have learned. A few things I have learned. The first section of this is what have I learned over 30 years that I needed to learn? And frankly, I didn't learn as much as I could have or should have or even possibly done here at the Sloan School or prior to that, because you just have to spend time on it. And there's five areas that have been really essential for me and I continue to do every day, even this week. The first part of this is how do you sell? Yeah, you probably haven't taken classes on selling, but I sell every day. I sell every day. I have to sell my employees on what I'm asking them to do. I have to sell my investors that we have the right plan. Yesterday I had two calls with investors. I have to sell customers. On Monday I was talking to a CEO and a CFO of a healthcare system here in Massachusetts about us doing more for them. So a big part of what I have done over the last 30 years is selling. So think about it. No matter what you have to do, you're going to have to present yourself, you're going to have to sell your ideas, you're going to have to convince other people, and possibly your employees, that what you're thinking about is the right thing. Second is, if you, if you hear my background, um, I've led people. And so the second thing is leadership. It's hard to learn through taking a class. I know you have some leadership classes, and I think they're fabulous because they weren't here when I was here. But this is just scratching the surface. And the best learning of leadership is through experiential learning. So I've learned a lot. Um, I think over the last 30 years, there's been a very short period of time where I haven't led or managed people. Started with managing a production line at Procter & Gamble, and today I manage a workforce of about 45,000 people. Managed in many different countries, managed different cultures. Th tremendous learning experiences. So another learning is how do you lead people? And in that respect, it's an important part of you get anything done in your business career. The third is just how do you make things better? How do you build value? You know, what are the tools you use? So I went to quality school. You know, some people are familiar with total quality management and, and quality tools. Um, I actually did that here in Cambridge. There was a group here in the 90s so that called the Center for Quality Management. And we learned at that point all the Japanese tools that were quite in vogue at that period of time. But through that learning and my experience over time, I, I learned a toolkit that I brought the Quest that I didn't learn at the Sloan School and I didn't learn at one specific company that I built over time. 
But you need to have your own toolkit of how you're going to build value, how you're going to be able to improve things that you come into, and you need to build that over time. I'll also say you need to understand how you're going to manage things. And you need to have a toolkit there as well. Um, you need to understand how you're going to manage time. You need to understand how you're going to manage your organization. You need to understand what your management system would be if you're running a business. And some people, some companies actually put in place management systems that they run their company on. If some of you have ever studied Danher, you see that they actually have their own Danher management system. And before you start there in any capacity, you have to go to the Danaher School and learn about how Danaher does it. Well, there is a way that Steve has put together in my mind you should run a business. And frankly, I'm doing that at Quest, but that's been built up over 30 years worth of experiences of what works for me. One that I learned at all these excellent companies I worked at. And it's something to keep in mind. How do you manage? And then finally is how do you communicate? I spent a large portion of my day communicating. I used to come home at night and Joe would ask me the question, what you do all day? Joe went to a lot of meetings. What the heck are you doing meetings for 12 hours, Dad? Well, that's what you do. You talk to people, you, you work on projects, you, you, work on, you work on your ideas. Um, and the communication takes all different forms. Communication like this in front of an audience. Communication with investors. We'll have sell-side analyst days. We'll have investor days. Communications through media, communications one-on-one, -on -one, communications on email. You have to be able to communicate in, in today's day and age, particularly when you're running a large organization, no matter what you do in your career. So the five things to keep in mind to, as you go forward, uh, what you didn't know then, but I knew now, is you have to sell, you have to lead, you have to think about how you're going to prove, you have to always put together a way that you're going to manage things, and then you have to be able to communicate all that. So think about it as you go forward. So what are some of the lessons? You probably picked up some of these things as I talked about what I did. And I've also been asked, you know, people come to my office and say, okay, how did you get to where you are? And I often answer the question, well, first of all, you've got to make sure you want to be to where I am. It's not for everybody, but it's right for me. So the first lesson I'll share with you is whatever you're asked to do, do a great job at it. It's that simple. Make sure whatever you take, you think you're going to be able to do a great job, because that's the most important part of moving your career along. Do a great job of what you've been asked to do. And when you do that, the next opportunity will come. So do a great job at whatever you've been asked to do. The second word of advice or lessons I've learned is sometimes your biggest disappointments will present the biggest opportunities. I've had a lot of dis disappointments in my career. And now when I think back at those disappointments and think what happened because I didn't get that job or didn't have the, the thing happen in business that I wanted to have happen, it opened a whole new opportunity that I look back now and said, thank God it happened. So when you get knocked down, don't worry about it. Get back up. Something good's going to happen. So your biggest disappointment could be your biggest opportunity. Third is find some role models. You know, I talked about the things you need to learn that you haven't learned at the Sloan School. There's a lot of things you can learn by just watching people. And I don't know why, but I realized when I started at HP, I would look around the rooms, and there was a lot of smart people there. It was a really good company back in 1984. They hired really good people out of MIT and Stanford and Harvard, all the best schools, kind of the, similar to some of the other high-tech companies in this day and age, like Google or whatever one you want to pick on. Um, but there were some, certain people that did better than others. And I said, you know, this person has the same background and experiences. What are they doing differently? Why are they more effective? why they've been more successful. And it's a bunch of small little things that add up to the ingredients of being successful with whatever you choose to do. And so watching some of those role models and also watching the things you don't want to do is, are equally important. So find some role models. Fourth on my list is make sure you find the right culture. I mentioned you I started at Procter & Gamble back in 
late 70s, early 80s. That was a very traditional culture. It was an excellent company. I'm proud to still say I worked for Procter & Gamble. It was a great place to start my career. I sort of felt, to be honest with you, that it wasn't quite right in terms of cultural fit. Because at that point, it was a little, it was a little conservative, a little, a little stodgy, if you will. I lost a share after I got out of the Sloan School and I started at Hilla Packard. I felt a night and day experience as far as how effective I could be and how well I could perform because it was a better cultural fit for me. It was more egalitarian. It was more open. It was much more progressive. It was more grounded, if you will. It was less hierarchical. You know, Bill and Dave ran the company. It was a real good fit for me. And frankly, if I, you know, a lot of this is luck, didn't make that choice, I'm not sure I'd be standing in front of you today. It was a good fit for me. And so when I interview people, I generally divided the interview into two parts. One is what they've done, what are their capabilities, but equally weighted is how well they're gonna fit into our culture and do within our company what we need to have them do. So that's very important. And then finally, is don't do something you don't like to do. Always find something you're gonna like to do. If you don't like it, you're not gonna be good at it. It's that simple. So the lessons is, you know, very, they're very simple. You know, always do a great job of whatever you've been asked to do. Sometimes these disappointments, you're gonna wake up and say, thank God it happened. Look for those people that you wanna emulate. Make sure you pick the right culture. And then finally, is always find things you want to do because if you don't find those, you're, going to, you're not going to be happy at it and you're not going to do a good job. So those are the lessons from a guy that's now 30 years away from where you sit right today. I'll share with you that uh, about, um, about a year ago, I was up the river. Actually, Harvard has a program uh, that they run for newly minted Fortune 500 CEOs and they get a, well, five or 10 of us together. And, um, and I went to it, and Michael Porter runs the program, and Bill George ran Medtronics as part of it, and Jay Lorsch is part of it, and the dean's very, very active involved in it. And, and the way they kick off the program is by starting with us presenting to the small group that you're with, and it's a closed group, of what you'd like to have people hear about at your retirement party when you completed this role. So you get up and you start talking about what you'd like for them to have said about you when you completed the role. So I'd just like to close with, you're sort of at that juncture, but I'll caution you if you can listen to what I just shared with you. I think it is important for you to have a picture, a frame of where you want to head but don't try to finish the picture. You never know how it's eventually gonna turn out, but I'm sure if you keep that picture in front of you, you'll go through your journey and you'll be sit standing in front of this, a new group 30 years from now with your own picture and you're gonna have a lot of fun in your career. So thank you, I'd like to take any questions you might have. <laughs> Who would like to start? Anything's fair. Um, I obviously work in the healthcare business. I could talk about healthcare. Could talk about my career. That was the intention of today. Stuck my career. I could talk about Quest Diagnostics and what we do there. Who'd like to start? Who's going to get the group going? Please. So, so would you like to talk a little bit about your failures? Any lesson learned? Any sure. advice you'd like to give us? Yeah, absolutely. Failures. Well, there was no failures. I had no failures. <laughs> And I, and I say that jokingly because, uh, you know, first of all, um, admitting that you fail is important. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So I started this new role in, in um, May of last year, May of 2012, May of 2012, about 20, 22 months. And um, let me tell you how this works. So I was working for Philips Healthcare. I was traveling a lot. It was based in Amsterdam. And you know this is a public company, it's a Fortune 500 company. Um, and 
I just saw the other day a statistic. There's only about 35 Fortune 500 jobs that become available every year in the whole world. 35 jobs. Okay? So if you want to do one of these, you've got to keep your eyes open and you've got to be you know, prepared. The other part of this statistic was 70% of those jobs, so let's just say 20, so there's 15, say a dozen, dozen jobs like this, 70% are filled internally. So coming in from the outside is, in, is unusual, okay? So it's not common and it's, there's not many, right? So um, given that I thought I wanted to do this next in my, my journey, um, I actually on Friday night I was reading the Wall Street Journal and, and I saw the story that Quest Diagnostics, the board had announced that you know, the CEO will be leaving and then they're gonna start an outside search. So I said, wow, that's kind of, I knew Quest. You know, I worked with Quest. I've been in the space for a while. I said, this be kind of, that would be an interesting opportunity. So lo and behold, I pick up the phone on Monday morning and I call you know, the search people you get to know over the time. There's only a handful of search people. Spencer Stewart's one of those search people. And I called the guy I know at Spencer and I said, you know, Joe, what's, you know, do you know what's, who's covering the, you know, the Quest search? Well, Steve, you know, I'm glad you gave me a call because I was going to give you a call. Lo and behold, I'm handling the search. You know, so I said, put me on the list and we'll have a conversation. So not going to too much time in this, but that was January. So January through March, while I'm doing my other job, you interview with the board, the outside board members. Um, I never put my feet in any Quest facilities during that entire period of time, nor was any Quest employee part of the process, including the CEO. So it was all done outside. They offered me the job in April. I figured out how we resign it. Phillips, and they want me to start on May 1st immediately. So I literally wrapped things up at Phillips on April 30th. I fly to New Jersey on Tuesday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. I knock on the door at Quest Diagnostics. My new admin assistant greets me at the door, and I'm their new CEO. Okay? That's how it works. Okay. Okay, so this is so you better be prepared if you want one of these jobs. Like, this is okay. This is what you have to walk into. So that that's been the journey for the last twenty months. So I was a new CEO. So what I, you know what I did is I took some time to learn what's going on. Obviously, you had to have a perspective. You have to interview with the outside board, and every one of these interviews is two to three hours, and going through what you would expect a board would go through, whether you're prepared and what you would do with the company. So I've, I had a perspective, I had an opinion. You can't get a job like this unless you have an opinion, right? But now you have to ground that opinion. So I spent a fair amount of time managing by wandering around, what I learned at HP. Got to sites, you know, talked to my management team, talked to investors, talked to shareholders, uh, talked, to, uh, talked to the board, and put together a strategy in the, in the course of that summer. And then we launched, at our first ever investor day, our new quest, which is a new direction for the company, in the fall of 2012. And I can tell you, it's a very aggressive plan that we've been executing. Yeah. So you asked me the question, and come back to your question, what have I failed at? You know, frankly, you get into it a year later, and you know, now we're into 2013, last year. Um, I knew that there were some things we did very, very well, but I also knew that we're changing so much that it had to be some things that there were concerns about within the organization. So frankly, what we did is we brought an outside group in, and there's a professor actually, used to be at Harvard, now he has his own consulting firm. They run a process called the Strategic Fitness Process, and what we did is we took 10 people in our organization, we had to interview another 10 people, and we had them give us feedback as a management team, verbatim feedback from the organization of what was going well and what was not going well. And so in the course of putting together all this change, so it's a substantial transformation program of a big company, we made some mistakes. So we're, you know, we asked the question, what were the mistakes? You just try to get too much, you try to get too much done in a short period of the time. Always a big mistake. You have an appetite to get a lot done. You're very ambitious about getting it all that done. But sometimes the organization can't just absorb it all. So one of the big mistakes, right? Which is okay, because I'd rather be on that side than not getting enough done. But one of the mistakes is with the transformation, you can take on a little too much and you gotta make sure your organization is in back of you. But we got some outside help to help us with that. The other part of this, it was actually helpful to the organization to actually hear that we're accepting feedback. 
We exposed ourselves. So you have the humility to expose yourself. You can't have it all right. And we asked them for their help. So biggest you know, challenge is trying to take on a little too much, but turn it back to your employees to say, what can we do about it? Okay. Please. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Oh, uh, thanks. If you were starting out, if you were in our position um, and knowing what you know now, um, how would you kind of start out your career from our, you know, the MBA program here? Depends what you want to do. Depends what you want to do. Um, I remember coming to one of these speak, um, one of these lecture series back when I was in your seats 30 years ago. He remembers certain words, and I hope you just remember a few things I said. You, know, you always hear these talks, and there's a couple of nuggets you pick out of it. But the talk I came to, because that was interesting, because I worked at Procter & Gamble. It was, the, it was the CEO or chairman of Procter & Gamble at the time. And I never forgot, forgot it. And somebody asked a similar question. And he said, you know what? These jobs aren't for everyone. And it was interesting. Yeah, you know, here he was, the chairman, CEO of Procter and Gamble. He figured, you know, a lot of people would like to do that job. And yeah, frankly, what I do, not all of you would want to do it. So it's all the pens of what you want, what what you have in that frame. You know, what what do you think the frame looks like? Because I think it is helpful to have a frame. I knew I wanted to run a business. I thought the outcome of that is to run a division of Philip Packer would be my dream. Okay. Fortunately, fortunately, I'm very fortunate. I got a chance to do that. And I actually did beyond my dreams of what I could do. But it's important to have that frame. And based upon that frame, I started to work on the things that I thought would get me on that journey without trying to figure it all out. So I would say, what's your frame? You know, do you want to be a sell side analyst? Do you want to work in the financial markets? Do you want to work in biotech? Then how do you get on that path and how do you get started? And then what do you want to do? You know, what, what do you want to do in that environment, is my advice to you. The second, um, the second lesson, I, message I got from some of those lectures, I remember John Reed. John, right, John Reed actually was, I think, the chairman of the board here at MIT. He ran Citigroup. He's actually a graduate of uh, MIT undergrad as well as the Sloan School. He spoke, and I never forgot it. He says, you know, it's you know, it's tough running Citigroup and it's you know, demanding job. And I brought technology to the company; it's great. Uh, because, but but I take time, you know, um, for the rest of my life. And I never forgot it. And I laughed about it. He goes, yeah, once a quarter, I see my brother. So oh my goodness, it's that tight that you have things down to quarters. You yeah, know, once a quarter, I see my brother. Yeah, and when it, that stuck with me, that I never wanted to get to the point where you're thinking in quarters as far as your brother and your kids and your mother. You know, you don't put it out of the same sequence, but it was an interesting fact, you know, that you get into some of these demanding roles and you can get yourself on a path that maybe it's not the path you want to be on. What was another question for me? Please. Hi, uh, Zen Chu. I teach Hi, healthcare Zen. ventures here. Yes. And uh, I'm just wondering how you balance you know, the fear of new technologies and the challenges with healthcare reform with just kind of growth opportunities, yeah. uh, whether that's in China or, uh, yeah. or, or, or new types of tests. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. At uh, healthcare, I was, I was talking to Dean earlier about healthcare, and, and in this country, we're going through this major transformation with the Accountable Care Act. And I can tell you, healthcare is changing dramatically in this country. And, some of it was planned, some of it was not planned, but it's happening, and you can look at it two ways. One is, oh my goodness, uh, with all this change, you know, there's so much uncertainty, why would you ever want to be there? The second is with all that change, what, there must be tremendous opportunities presenting themselves. So take advantage of those opportunities. So he asked a specific question about innovation, and you know, healthcare is tricky. And, and I talked about the US, and you asked a question about you know, China. And I would just broaden that question about China to emerging markets, because at least in my other role, it's significant presence in all the emerging markets in the world. Well, healthcare um, moves at a much slower rate of change in speed than any other market I know. Things take time. 
And, and that's the problem when you're making investments in breakthrough innovation, really disruptive technologies in healthcare, is you gotta really make sure that you're not on the bleeding edge. And so coming back to the earlier question, what was, what was some of your big you know, mistakes you've made? I've made some big investments, big investments, hundreds of millions of dollars in new space in healthcare that still to this day haven't materialized. So why is that and you know, where were they? Well, if you go back to 1984, 1984, 30 years ago, we were all dreaming that every hospital system in the United States and a large part of the developed world would have an electronic medical record. We started to write our own, at that point, as object-oriented programming language. You guys won't even understand what I'm talking about. This is really antiquated by, your, by contemporary um, application development uh, languages today. But we started writing our own clinical information systems work. And we started introducing, this is at HP, an electronic medical record. You still look today, and you look at hospitals, the most advanced hospitals in the United States, they're still working through getting an electronic medical record. And I can tell you there's, you know, there's graveyards full of IT companies that have invested in information systems in healthcare over the years. I'll also share, you know, this, you might have read, there's a lot of buzz around this. You know, this innovative company is actually Silicon Valley based. It's called Theranos. Theranos. And Theranos says, okay, says, and I say, I'll say this carefully because it's not quite clear what they really do have. They have a capability of a laboratory on a chip, laboratory on a chip, and they could basically do what I do with 30,000 people running these laboratories, uh, Quest Diagnostics, with a drop of a blood on an integrated circuit. Well, I can tell you that at HP in our semiconductor business, I invested in that. At Philips, who had a large semiconductor business, we invested in that. And that was 20 years ago. Okay. And I wonder, really, do they have it or not? Um, because we actually you know, are now hearing about this, and Walgreens has announced that they're going to use Theranos to do some finger stick diagnostics in some of their stores throughout the country. And then actually when we go to see what they're doing, it's not quite how they're presenting themselves. But I use that as another example with these great ideas where there's a proof of concept, but it just takes a long period of time. Now, with all that said, you could find some spots. And the, and the trick is in healthcare is to find those innovations that really do have the dynamics in the business model in back of those to be disruptive. And you go through example upon example of categories of those that have popped in a reasonable period of time, and you can find them. If you look at stents back when they you know, first hit the market in an interventional cardiology back in the 90s, that one moved fast, moved very fast. It was great innovation at the right time with the right economics in the back of it. I actually see walking through the halls, you see automatic external defibrillators, AEDs. I actually bought a company uh, and when I was working at HP called HeartStream, where we're one of the early pioneers in AEDs. And I'd say in a six to eight year period of time, that became a reasonable sized business. Now we sold that to Philips later on, and now Philips is one of the category leaders in AEDs. So you've got to find them at the right period of time, at the inflection point when the market's ready for it, but there has to be an economic model in back of it. So you can be on the bleeding edge, but you can also find some nice spots in healthcare. Okay, next question. Please, right here. Hi, thank you. I'm a master finance student here. Hi there. Uh, would you like to share with us some of the tips that you deal uh, that you use to deal with pressure and settlebacks, and how do you manage your energy? Yeah, uh, <laughs> pressure and setbacks, huh? Yeah, how do you deal with pressure? You know, uh, you know, I'm fortunate. Um, I think I'm wired the right way for some of what I do, and I think yeah, you know, part of this is just being with the right disposition and the right you know genes to be able to cope with the pressure I do. Um, what I want to share with you is uh, I do have an ability, okay, to be very intense at work and accomplish what we have talked about accomplishing in the last 30 years and, and do that. You have to be successful at applying yourself and being very, very focused. But it didn't take over my entire life. And I could shut it off pretty easily. 
you know, I would get home. Uh, matter of fact, I was joking with Joe because Joe was in Indonesia on the G Lab project, and he came back to the West Coast, and I think he went on one of your ski trips to Park City. It wasn't sponsored by the school, I hear. It was a bunch of you went to Park City, and um, he jumped on the red eye. He came home. He goes, I said, how was it? He goes, wow, you know, red eye's tough. I said, wow. Well, I can remember, you know, I can remember, um, you know, leaving Boston on Saturday morning, you know, flying to Asia, spending, you know, a whole week in Asia, and then you know, jumping on a plane in Narita in Japan at four in the afternoon on Friday after full day of work in Japan, tra traveling through, you know, California, and then arriving here in Boston the afternoon on the same day, you know, that works. And then getting home to Joe, and Joe's, you know, five or six, saying, hey, Dad, what are we gonna do tonight? <laughs> so, but when Joe came over, that was dad. So I think being able to shut it off was really, really important. Really, really important. And, and those are weeks. You know, God, I, I, I added it up. I'd be traveling in an airplane 40 hours. I was, on the, I was in the air 40 hours. Probably in the airplane 50 hours. Never mind the 60, 80 hour work week. Incredible amount of work, but be able to shut it off. You gotta be able to shut it off. And that has helped me. That has helped me. And frankly, unless you do that, you're gonna burn out. You're not gonna be achieve what you're gonna be able to achieve. Okay, so you got to work on it. Maybe one quick question, and then we have to break. Please. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question on your experience when you joined class, mm -hmm. uh, especially considering the fact that you were new. Yeah. What challenges do you face? How do you think you were able to manage that? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. The question is, you know, when you joined the class, how did you do it? Well, first of all, um, you know, I, I took a fair amount of time, but you can't take too much time because. We're a publicly traded company, people want to know what Steve's going to do. So I had to quickly gain support for it with my board, gain support of it with my employees, with my management team, and then launch it in about a six month period of time. And that was, you know, it's not a lot of time to do all that. No. So, so to do that is, you know, you have to take time to work with people. You have to gain support and you have to do it quickly. Um, and so what I mentioned as part of the skill set you learn over the years is you have to, you have to get out, you have to, you, have to, you have to walk around, you have to talk to people, you have to travel, you have to gain your support for your ideas. And so what I mentioned in the tools, you know, part of this is listening, but you also have to communicate, and then you have to build quickly some reasonable support for it going forward. You know, I'm also I often asked a question by investors, um, you know, what was your pleasant surprise? And, and also what was your disappointment of, uh, of, join, of what you found at Quest after you joined it? Yeah, my pleasant surprise, and this is the compliments to the people I joined in, and part of the reason I joined the company is because I knew of the company's history and reputation, is what I was pleasantly surprised with in this company is 45,000 people, it's a big company, you have a, driving a lot of change is the acceptance of the organization for the change that we're bringing on in alignment with what we're trying to accomplish in a very short period of time. They really picked up the pace. Yeah, they really picked up the pace. I'll also share with you the disappointment, which gets to your last question, it was all around a culture that had a change. And so a large part of our change effort, our transformation effort, is all around culture. And frankly, culture gets overused as a term. It really gets down to specific behaviors that were at this company that have to get better. And so we have five areas that we're working on. One is we have to be faster in everything we do. It was a very slow moving company. You know, getting back to the other question around innovation, healthcare moved at a very glacial pace that had to change. And we're moving fast, change fast. Second is uh, it wasn't a team sport there. A lot of silos. Can't be silos in healthcare. Everybody's working together, integrated delivery systems. We need to look like what our market's like. So you have to work together as an organization. We change the organization, it has to be different. You know, third is it has to be much, there had to be much more transparency. It starts with me, and so we're being open and that's going forward to our customers. Um, fourth is it wasn't a very performance oriented culture. A lot of regard for activity, but it wasn't always clear that the activity got the results that we wanted. So a lot more, edgy performance management. And then finally, it was a very internally oriented company. You know, you walk the halls and you hear about the next meeting people were going to, you wouldn't be hearing about the next deal they're trying to get. And that had to change. So we're driving that, and that's not gonna happen overnight, but we talk about it, we put that in place, 
And with all the good that these people embraced, we also admit there's things we need to change to be able to be a more successful company going forward. It's my job along with them to make that happen. Okay? So thank you for uh, your, your time and good luck.